Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a response to a video that was put out by Tavahaya Singer 13 hours ago. Uh, today is the day after uh, the 25th when people were celebrating Christmas. And so uh, I think he sent this out on Christmas Day that was saying Jesus uh, basically delivered the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, for anti-Semitic purposes, uh, promoting ethnic bigotry against Jews. So we're going to ask the question, is that true or not? And uh, I do not doubt that people have used this in an anti-Semitic way against Jewish people uh, because people can take an ambiguity in a passage that doesn't explain itself. Parables are those things that you need to study to be sure you know what the meaning is. So I'm not going to say he's never confronted anti-Semitism based on this passage, but I'm going to say that is not Jesus's point. In fact, it was actually, in my view, subtly, in the nice way Jesus is, deriding ethnic bigotry by Jewish people against the mixed culture of Torah observers, namely the Samaritans. And we'll get into that. And I just want to explain something. So uh, I guess that's the setup. Okay, so now let's look at where the, uh, whether that my argument there has validity, meaning that the point of Jesus's message was the Samaritans only believed in the Torah and they rejected incorrectly the acceptance of the prophets. And they didn't have any reference at all for the writing section. Now, we're going to see that that issue about this writing section kind of actually accords with Jesus. And we'll see that in a second. But the definitely Jesus was in favor of the law and the prophets. And he says so in Matthew 5, 17. So, um, so, you know what? Let's just race ahead to that real quick. I want to show you something. Okay, the left side here are all the quotations of Jesus of from the law and prophets. And you can just see it's numerous citations. And I put the uh, the the uh, the source. So it's Joshua, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Minor Prophets, and so on and so forth. And when you go to the, uh, the text that quotes from the writing section, uh, the original writing section. And as Christians, we don't even know how, this division, but the Jewish people kept track of it. And the Psalms are quoted seven times. And Daniel's quoted twice. I believe that the Jewish people put Daniel into the writing section after Christ. And I think they did that because they did not want to acknowledge that was a prophecy because there's two prophecies in there, two passages about the Messiah and when he would come and so on. So uh, to to uh, take a point of disagreement with Jesus, they took this out of the prophet section. I believe the great synagogue decided back in the 440 period that Daniel was added to canon. Now, if you look at the Jewish Encyclopedia, you can't tell was it put in the prophets or the writing section. I, it's hard to imagine you would take the prophet Daniel and put him in the writing section because he's in no way does, is he like Esther who never even quotes God. Okay, so there's things that you inherently should recognize as Daniel claims to be a prophet you can't just simply put him in the writing section, regardless. Seven times Jesus quotes only the Psalms, and Psalms are just songs most of the time. Daniel, uh, Psalm 2 is a prophetic psalm. So some Psalms are prophetic, but most of them aren't. And uh, anyway, so you can see Jesus himself doesn't have a high regard for the writing section, but he does for the long prophets. So now let's go back and look at the Samaritans, and we'll see that they don't accept the prophets. So the Jewish canon by Jesus' day was divided up in law, prophets, and writings. The law was called Torah. The prophet section was called Navim. The writing section was called Ketavim. And when you use the first initial of each of those, Torah, Navim, and Ketavim, and you say them together, it comes out Tanakh. So that's where it comes from. The prophet section was finalized about 200 before the Christian era. The writing section, or the Ketavim, was referred to in a Greek commentary on Ecclesiastic as other books. So the Ketavim are what? Other books. So that's important because this is how the, uh, the the grouping, the acknowledgement of what the writing section were or how they should be treated is by this term of other books. Um, so there was discussion of the law, the prophets, and other books. That was how it was often spoken it, many times, but they were meaning to refer to the writings. Anyway, the Sadducees, that's the uh, people in charge of the temple, the Le Levites were attached to them. And so they only accepted Torah as inspired. So that would be presumably in the parable of the Levite priest. He only believes in Torah. And, and the other books were prized and read as edifying. 
So presumably the Levite priests would treat the prophetic books as prized and read as edifying books. Now people say, oh, that's shocking. You're saying they didn't accept them as prophets. Well, they did, but the, I'm sure they didn't mean, they wanted to be clear, it's not the same way we revere Moses. And why is that? Because in the book of the Numbers, Miriam and Aaron, who had prophetic messages, asked God, we want to have the same uh, status as Moses, that we can do things that he's doing, and he's, he's not the only one who can do X, Y, Z. And God gets very upset with Miriam and, and gives her leprosy for saying this. And then God has to explain to her, you don't understand. Moses, you know, he's put in charge of all my house. And uh, and I meet with him face to face, not literally face to face, but he says, I meet him face to face. And when I talk to him, I talk to him clearly, not in riddles and not by visions. But when I talk to all other prophets and that he meant by that Miriam and their own, I talk to them in uh, by visions and riddles and not face to face. So that's why. I think the Sadducees were saying, we're going to just say is to the prophetic works, we'll prize them, we'll, re we'll read them as edifying, so as not to dis displace any authority of Moses. But uh, but they would treat it in, in, in a prized way. They would treat it as true. But, you know, again, Moses can cancel out the Torah. The Torah can always cancel out a prophetic work if there's an inconsistency. And that's really what God was saying. Moses is clear. If Moses says something and there's a prophet who says something else, you go with Moses. That's really the bottom line of that passage in Numbers. Uh, the, the Jews of Alexandria and Egypt accepted the Torah as inspired, but also revered the prophets and the writings. Okay, so you have this reverence, in, and these are the more Hellenized Jews. They're out in Alexandria, Egypt. That's the capital of Egypt. The Samaritans only accepted the Torah as inspired and to be revered. And that's really the point I was having with the lady in my letter to her. So, so they made a mistake. They didn't give any reverence or respect or or acknowledgement to the to the prophet prophets, let alone the writing section, which you know that was even Jesus didn't give it that much authority. The Sadducees and Samaritans rejected the writings section as, hold on, as inspired. It was edifying. Well, I, I must say that there's no clear understanding that the Samaritans thought the writing section was edifying. So I should make that correction here. So that's why the, the, this is really what Jesus is highlighting. You've got a Levitical priest who has a slightly different standard. He believes he's a Sadducee class. So go back to Sadducee. Sadducees only accept the Torah as inspired and the other books, meaning uh, that would include apparently uh, the prophets and the writings, and they were prized and read as edifying, but not on the same level as Torah. Now the, but the Samaritans only accepted, everybody knows that they didn't, they rejected the prophets and rejected the writings. They didn't want to care about anything else, but the Torah. So that makes them heretics. So the question is, can a heretic be more righteous than a Levite priest who has the right view of scripture? And the answer of Jesus is yes, the Samaritan can be more righteous than a person who has the, the correct canon. And that's very important because it tells us that intrinsically the issue isn't what canon you believe, but how you behave pursuant to the Torah. Because if you follow and obey the Torah, you, you, the bottom line is the prophets are just simply amplification, clarification, but fundamentally, if you obey Torah, you're on the right square. You, you know, you basically can't be knocked off the block so to speak. All right, so I'm going to take a break right here, and I'll be right back. Okay, so we're going to play a two and a half minute clip from uh, Tavia Singer's uh, video entitled, uh, Tavia Singer Exposes Anti-Semitic Parable of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans in the temple period, in the second temple period, even in the first temple period, were a big problem for the Jews. The Samaritans came into the land of Israel through the Assyrian Empire. When the 10 tribes were carried off by the Assyrian Empire, the Samaritans were the replacement group that came into Israel and they 
were pagans and sought to convert to Judaism because they were being attacked by lions. The point is that their conversion to Judaism was very much insincere, was for all the wrong reasons, and their conversion was not accepted, and they became the problem people. They did whatever it took to impede the building of the temple. They reject the notion that Jerusalem was, in fact, God's holy city. That's going to come up in the book of John where, with the Samaritan woman, because the Samaritan woman says, well, which is it? In a conversation with Jesus, she goes, which is the holy place? You know, is it Grisim, as my father say, or, you know, Jerusalem? And Jesus says to her, don't mess with the Jews. I mean, salvation is of the Jews. What they have is correct, right? They're not the best, but that's where salvation is of the Jews. So it's important for you in order to grasp What's going to Luke is to leave, to depart the 21st century and enter into the first century. In the first century, the, Samar the Samaritans were the people who were the problem people for the Jews. So they weren't Jews, but they were Jews wannabe. And they said, we're the true Jews. And it was a nightmare. I'm not going to go through all the stuff, but big, they created big problems for us. They were a nightmare. So when you contrast the behavior of a priest and a Levite with that of a non-Jew, but it's a Jew wannabe, that's the ultimate attack against the Jewish people. The point of the Good Samaritan, to anyone who actually reads through this parable, is to convey that this person was not even Jewish, who, who have, whose fathers are wrong. But they care about people. They have more passion about people. And they have more, there's just, there's more in them. And the Jews are just cold hearted. You have a, another parable of the 10 lepers that will come up seven chapters later in Luke chapter 17. And the, the lepers are healed, but only when the Samaritan comes back to express his understanding that it was the glory of Christ. That means the Samaritan is the good guy better than the Jews? That's the ultimate put down. So unless you know that, you don't understand what Luke is doing here. Do you see what this does to good Christians? Do you understand how a good Christian, a, a, a person who is otherwise completely moral, would have an uncharitable view of Jewish people? Okay, so here's the Jewish encyclopedia. Here's what they say. The Samaritans are properly inhabitants of Samaria. The name is now restricted to a small tribe of people living in Nablus and calling themselves Bene Israel, or sometimes, I don't know the Hebrew there. Their history as a distinct community begins with the taking of Samaria by the Syrians in 722. On the separation of Israel and Judah, so there was the kingdom of the north, which was known as the kingdom of Israel also, and then it was the kingdom of the south, also known as the kingdom of Judah. The ancient city of Shechem, which had been for the first from the first so intimately connected with the history of israel became naturally the religious center of the northern kingdom so the kingdom of israel was located at shechem the political capital however was transferred by omri to his newly built city of samaria about 883 bc so now it went from shechem to samaria samaria and the israelitish kingdom continued to exist there until it fell before Assyria. And I don't know what this means, Israelitis. I think they don't want to say Israel because then you get confused historically. So they should just say the northern Israelite kingdom is how I think they should say it. Continued to exist there until it fell before Assyria. In the fourth year of Hezekiah, so he's the king of Judah, Shemenezer, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, they took it. So now Samaria is conquered. And then, quote, uh, well, the next portion is the inhabitants were deported to various parts of Assyria. So the people who lived in the region we now know as Samaria, northern, what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, were deported as part of their loss to Assyria. And they were taken to Assyria and the cities of the Medes. And, the colon and colonists were sent to take their place. The colonists were soon after troubled by lions which they regarded as a divine visitation due to their ignorance of the manner of the God of the land. Uh, and then there's a quote, at their request, an Israelitish priest was sent to them. I don't, again, understand why they say Israelitish. Did you get one from Israel or not? Obviously, they have a, a special meaning to the term. But I think what it is, is they wanted a Jewish-approved 
priest to come uh, to them to then help them. They're now facing all these lion attacks and they want help. And this priest came and settled at Bethel. And this is in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 28, with the result that a mixed form of religion was established. And this is where I find the problem. Partly Israelitish and partly idolatrous. You know, that, that didn't need to be said, did it? <laughs> I, I, and I don't know, unless it had a point. And in what way were they idolatrous? Or, but what it is, is they're trying to follow Israel and they are learning to get more away from their idols, but they haven't gotten away from them yet. It doesn't mean they're not sincere and working hard towards getting rid of idols uh, of false gods that they had believed in when they were in Assyria or um, in, in, in other places. Then it says, the next reference to the people of Samaria regarded as the remnant of Israel. It says that's, a, that's now a very positive statement. So they were calling them partly idolatrous and partly not. Now they're known as a remnant of Israel. Is when Josiah suppressed the high places among them and collected money to repair the house of the Lord, presumably at, uh, well, I don't know, from Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel. That the Israelitish element still held its own in the north is shown by the incidental mention, quote, that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria in the time of Jeremiah, desiring to join in the offerings at the temple. Presumably that's in Jerusalem, I assume. That's Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 5. Later on, and this is the last mention of the Samaritans in the Old Testament. So this is where they disappear, and they're going to be next mentioned by Jesus, right? Their claim to a participation in the building of the temple was rejected by Zerubbabel, no doubt on the ground of their mixed origin. And that's what I wanted to point out. That, to me, is a reflection by the Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, the Jewish Bible itself, the Jewish Encyclopedia, excuse me, th that the reason they, the last we, thing we know is there was a decision to reject them due to their mixed origin. Despite the fact they were doing everything right, they'd asked for our Jewish priests to come, they asked to, uh, they're following Torah, now they didn't include the prophets, you know, but they, they were following Torah, and yet the Jewish people treated them as second-class citizens. And I think what's very clear from the parable, not the parable, but the story of Jesus uh, meeting a, par a Samaritan woman by a well is she's shocked that he's even talking to her. He asks her for water and she says, you know, we don't have anything to do. Jews and Samaritans have nothing to do with each other. And so what is Jesus doing? He's breaking down what? A, a religious and ethnic bigotry against people who live in the north. And they, I assume they're ethnically different in appearance because of where they came from in Assyria. That seems to me a natural thing that could be uh, in effect. So there's a ethnic and religious bigotry against the Samaritans, which Jesus broke down by talking to the Samaritan woman. And now by telling this parable about a Samaritan who, even though he, they don't include the prophets, at all, or the writings, they don't give them any reverence at all, and they only revere the Torah uh, that they're looked down upon for some what, for whatever reason. And I think what Jesus was saying is, you need to get rid of that. These people can be more righteous than you because following the Torah is what really matters. Ultimately, I mean, you, some things in the prophets are useful or edifying. Jesus wasn't saying he he personally believed in the the prophets, and he said so in Matthew five seventeen to nineteen. But on the other hand, he's also saying they could be righteous before God by simply listening and following the Torah. So now, when you step back, now you look at from the higher view, instead of Jesus inciting any kind of religious bigotry, he's actually teaching Jewish people, do not be religiously bigoted. Now, is it possible someone could take Jesus's words and misconstrue this as trying to paint a Levitical person as a self selfish and not caring about someone's suffering and it's a reflection on the entire race of jews instead of what it seems more in the historical context is jesus was saying that a samaritan who's looked down by everybody because they're of a different ethnicity and have a different canon that, that nobody expects they'll do the right thing but you know what in this situation you can have someone who knows the torah is true knows that the prophet section is true uh, or revered and and yet they won't follow it that so just just having different 
uh, religious beliefs about what's canon doesn't mean you're going to do the right thing in the right circumstance. And so someone who has a def defective view about canon, but at least has the Torah, the Ten Commandments for sure, they're in a better position when they obey than the one who has all these things that are on paper, but they don't obey what's in it. So I think there's a really uh, different message I get from Jesus that, that I conveyed years ago to this lady that I, so I think I have legitimacy. It's been published online for over a decade that I've never, I didn't come up with this view today to, to rebut uh, Tobias Singer. I'm just, I'm offering another solution other than seeing Jesus in the worst light possible. And that's the other thing I would say to Mr. Singer is, is sometimes you have to look, check your own biases and your own, uh, and I don't want to say bigotry, but you, you can end up being too harsh and judge someone too harshly when you don't know the full context or you're not weighing all the possible meanings of Jesus, why would you go to the one meaning that would actually be not a good idea to promote? Because if you're saying Christians should, Christians are going to follow Jesus no matter what. Are you saying he's anti-Jewish? Because you're not helping the cause of, of uh, Judaism by saying that Christians who follow Jesus should be anti-Jewish, because that's supposedly what, <laughs> what the passage means. It would be more wise, if I would say wise is the right th approach, is to not promote that that Jesus is anti-Semitic, and it doesn't make sense. He's Jewish, so it, it's just crazy anyway. And I think if you sit back, uh, Mr. Singer, and you just look at it, you go, "No, of course, uh, I don't know what got over me. I was trying to make a point, and it got got away from me." And that happens to all of us. None of us are perfect. But definitely this was one where I would say, no, I think there's a lot of other possibilities here than Jesus was teaching Christians to be anti-Semitic. Now, I do want to say one more thing that does support some part of what you're saying in this way. So w there is a book. Well, let me let me pause here. I want to I want to show on the screen so people know what I'm talking about, a book uh, by Mr. Malk. I want to show that uh, caption. Okay, so here's where I would agree in part with the objective was to make non-ethnic Jews, people who were not of the uh, pure Jewish background, Jewish or Israelite or Hebrew ethnicity, wanted to show someone who's not ethnically Jewish or ethnically Hebrew is still a good person. So that is a secondary uh, purpose that uh, Luke probably did have, which was not intended, therefore, to make Jewish people look bad, but make a non-Jew look good. So that's really the reason I'm bringing this up. So this is a book called uh, by Mr. Malk. He was a, he's an attorney from Chicago, um, and he wrote a book called Paul on Trial, the Book of Acts as a Defense of Christianity. I recommend this to Weisinger and anyone who wants to understand the Book of Acts in its real context. So uh, his thesis of this book, and I, it's backed up with a lot of proof, is that uh, both the book of Luke and the book of Acts are written th to Theophilus. And it has all the appearance he, he calls a most excellent Theophilus, which is a way you would address a magistrate judge in Roman times because you were trying to appeal to their authority as a judge. And a magistrate judge was appointed in all cases where an appeal was made to Nero. And when the Book of Acts is concluded, so the Book of Acts is written at a point where we're waiting. It's two years away at, after the Book of Acts closes where Paul is going to have an appeal in front of Nero. And that appeal really occurs later two years. And Paul is acquitted in that first uh, uh, hearing in front of, of Nero. And he goes to Spain and the rest is all history. So uh, this book proves that who Theophilus likely was because of that form of address, because of the legal procedures that had to be followed. And then he, he says you can look and see things like what we're, you're pointing out about this message in the book of Luke about the Samaritans. So why, why did Luke want to make non-Jews look good when you are on appeal to a non-Jewish Roman emperor, and you're being reviewed by a magistrate judge named Theophilus, who also is a non-Jew. Oh, because you want to show that non-Jews are acceptable within Christianity. Uh, okay, so it's not about making a Jewish person 
or a Hebrew person look bad. It's instead trying to make non-Jewish people or not people who are not 100% ethnically Jewish to look good. And if you could show that, that Jesus is putting a good light on them or he socializes with the Samaritan woman at the well or whatever, these are good reflections of the good relations that Christians have with non-Jews, okay? And therefore, when the Romans have to decide, and Nero is going to have an opportunity to make a decision adverse to Christianity and say, you're not going to be subject, you, you're not going to have the protection we've given the Jewish people under Judaism. We've approved their religion as a legally approved religion, but you, Christians, we're going to say you're so wacky, you're so far off from Jewish people because of what's going on there at the temple and Paul and Trophimus and all these things in Acts 21, 22, we're going to say that you're illegal. And that's what we, that was what the Christian church was most afraid of. So Luke is, in my opinion, when it said he was a doctor, he was more of a doctor of laws. He's proved to be an excellent lawyer because he did exactly what a lawyer is supposed to do is put your case in the best position possible. So both the gospel and the book of Acts are not written to, uh, to, uh, venerate Paul for Christians to believe in him. No, not at all. This was for us to get pagans to like Paul and pagans to want to rule in favor of Paul. And just to prove my point, Tavia, because I hope you see this, is just look at Acts 17. Paul says that God does not dwell in a temple made of human hands. Now, you and I both know that that is false biblically, right? Because at that time, God dwelled in the temple of human hand made of human hands at Jerusalem. Why would Luke include something that even Luke knows is false in a in a book written for Theophilus, the magistrate judge who's assisting Nero? Because in in pagan religions, the god the gods do not live in temples of human hands, contrary to how the Jewish god uh, Yahweh uh, had trained the Jewish people to understand he can do that. But the Roman and Greek gods don't do that. You say, well, what were all the temples for? Oh, well, the temples were not where they lived. The temples where they went and ate the sacrificial meat, in theory, or they were there while we were eating the meat, you know, when, when these pagans were eating the meat. But where they live is on Mount Olympus, and they don't ever really le le stop living there. So, so in a pagan land, it's true that the gods do not dwell in temples made of human hands, and they never will. They will dwell for a lunchtime, a dinner time meal, whatever you're doing, they'll be there and then they'll disappear. And they're, they're just in spirit. But the God of Israel, that God we know dwells at, at that time, dwelled in the temple of Jerusalem. So why is Luke saying what he's saying? Because he's trying to appeal to pagans to like Paul, because he, Paul, is himself trying to be a pleasing to the Areopagus court. He's when he makes that statement at Athens in front of the Areopagus court. And these are all pagan philosophers, Stoic philosophers. It's all mentioned by Luke. And that's why. And there's lots of other things like that. Like in uh, Acts 16, 6, there's a pagan priestess. The Python priestess of the Delphic Oracle had a sister uh, uh, Python priestess in Philippi. And she endorses Paul's way of salvation, his way of salvation, not the way of Christ's salvation, but the way of Paul's salvation. And Paul puts up with this for many, many days, but then finally gets frustrated because why? She's possessed by a demon, Tavia, and so he's got to cast the demon out of her. So would Christians really look at this story if, the, if we were ever educated? Because, of course, our translators never tell us her real name. and They leave it disguised and they call her a... Uh, 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 I forget, like a, a romance, a necromancer or something. They use some other word, but they, d they don't translate the word Python, which would immediately, if you looked it up in the internet, you'd find out, oh, Python priestesses, oh, those are the Delphic oracles. Oh, okay. We would be, we would be shocked <laughs> that, that a Python priestess was endorsing Paul's way of salvation for many days. But a Nero and Theophilus, who believed this Delphic oracle and her, the sister at Philippi, that these the, whatever they said goes. So he was writing, uh, uh, the book of Acts is written to appeal to uh, the pagan uh, uh, Nero and the pagan Theophilus. That's why we're writing it. 
And that's why we'll ex Luke will say things that would never in a million years, if Christians could see the words that are hidden from us now under the, uh, you know, the Greek has been covered over with this layer of English mistranslations, and we don't see the word Python anymore, and we don't understand what that meant, and therefore we don't understand what's happening. <laughs> And we're being disoriented by our translators mistranslating passages constantly. But but this book, Paul on Trial, he's pointing to facts like this to say, hey, look, there's no way in God's green earth that this wasn't written for pagans to like Paul and what he was doing. And that's why we have uh, the book of Acts having, and excuse me, the book of Luke having a story about a Samaritan being uh going on the way to uh pass somebody and he is the one who helps not the levite priest. okay so here's because where i trying, would agree that in part directly appeal the objective to the pagans. Was to make so this is not about non making jewish people look bad in fact jews in fact it was against not our interest to make the, the jewish people look bad uh, why because jewish if the jewish, jewish people ever lost Israelite their protection as a Jude Hebrew judaism had ethnicity. legal protection from rome it was uh, called a uh gotta remember the word for it Relahio, Rela religione uh, licita or I think I think it was so it was an a, it was a permitted religion we don't want to do anything to undermine Judaism because that's how we are operating but it was very clear that with this appeal Nero could say hey wait a minute these Christians are not part of Judaism theoretically and if so I, I and Paul brought in this guy Trophimus and he defiled the temple that's what happened Tobiah you got to read that sometimes Acts 21 he defiled the temple he went in uncircumcised past the middle wall of, of separation paul says well i wasn't there i didn't i didn't uh i was ceremonially washing myself when that happened i i didn't have anything to do with it so that's how clear we were at risk of being treated differently from judaism so we we had to try to stay underneath the judaism pr approval so there was absolutely no intent in my view to tell in, in in the book of luke there would be no intention ever to make the jewish religion look bad in fact if you look carefully in acts 21 it has james saying many myriads many tens of thousands of jews have accepted christ okay and then he says paul i've heard rumors that you have become an apostate apostasia and again that's a word that's hidden in our translation so Tobiah, go to biblegateway.hub Go to the Mount C Transliteral, type in Acts 21, verse 21, and you will see the Greek words. And the word there is apostasia, which is mistranslated for every Christian that we never get to see it. But it, but it's translated as uh, you were teaching against the customs of, of uh, Moses, not apostasy. That We're not going to let Christians know that's the word there. We're never going to translate it that in a million years. They'll never find out until... The Mount Transliteral came along and we can now show anybody in a second. So that's the point is he was trying to show the Roman people reviewing this, that our leadership, James, the 12, were, were afraid that Paul had gone too far. So if anything, the church in the book of Acts is trying to separate it, give a little ground that in case Paul loses, we were, we were basically saying we kind of found out this guy's really not on the same page with us. He's an apostate. We think, but we don't have proof yet. And we told them, go do this ritual vow with these few guys and help them with the, the Nazarite vow. So that's what goes on. So there is absolutely no purpose on God's green earth that the 12 and James in particular would want to make the Jewish people look bad. And to, to the contrary, they wanted to make it clear that Jew Christianity was pro-Jewish. And that's what's really in the book of Acts. And that's really what's the purpose of the book of Luke as well to not make Jewish people look bad, but make that make it look like Christianity is open to non-Jews and to do it in a way that doesn't denigrate the Jewish people at the same time. Okay, I hope that makes the point. And uh, so I, I think you should maybe take a look at this book and it might give you a new perspective on uh, Christianity and what the book of Acts is all about. It really helps a lot of people to see this book and go, oh, this explains, this will change your whole mind about what is the whole point of the book of Acts and the book of Luke. So I pray you take a look at that, Tobiah, if you happen to get this, see this video. Okay, take care, everybody. Everybody else, I hope this helped you. Take care, ciao, bye.